Much was unique about the Jewish state. But in choosing socialism as its strategy for development, Israel was part of a swelling tide. For the nations reaching for independence in the aftermath of World War II, state planning was held out as the quickest path to prosperity. Sixty nations in the developing world would eventually adopt some form of socialism. Most were in Africa. The country that became known as Tanzania would provide the world with a leader whose vision of socialism fused the ideas of the West with the traditions of Africa. His name was Julius Nereri. Nereri's father was a tribal chief in northwestern Tanganyika, as the British territory was then known. And when the colonialists wanted somebody from the chief family to go to school, and he was virtually taken away from his, his goods and taken to school. That was the beginning of Julius. By 1949, Nereri had made it all the way to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. At Edinburgh, he started studying with socialist teachers who uh, talked about community property. And Nereri said, we've got community property. That's what we have in my tribe. And suddenly, it seemed as if the ways that he was used to, which he had always been told were very uh, backward and uh, sort of a source of shame, were actually uh, corresponding very nicely to the most advanced social thought, that is the ultimate society that people in Europe were looking forward to. When Nereri returned to Tanganyika in 1952, colonial unrest had spread across the continent. To the north, Kenya was engulfed in the violent Mau Mau Rebellion. Tanganyika was much quieter, but talk of independence was in the air. Nereri took a job as a teacher, but he found his true calling in politics. He soon remade an old social club into his country's first political party. As the party attracted thousands of followers across the nation, Nereri kept the title of his old profession, Mwalimu, Swahili for teacher. In 1961, Tanganyika finally won its independence from Britain. At midnight on December 9th, the Tanganyikan flag flew for the first time. The next year, the country swore in Julius Nereri as its first president. He had been elected with more than 98% of the vote. Nereri set out to slay the three dragons that plagued his country, ignorance, poverty, and disease. His weapon would be socialism, fused with the ancient tribal customs of Africa. The word he used to describe it was Ujamaa, Swahili for familyhood. What my father believed in socialism, the way I understand it, is that um, right after independence, most Tanzanians were uneducated and were not all that wealthy. So we had to, to move together. Rosemary Nereri was born in the same year her father led the country to independence. She is now a member of parliament herself. Mwalimu used to say that um, it's not new because that's how we live. You go to a typical Tanzanian village, a typical African village. We don't have these nuclear families, just the mother and the father and the children. We have lots of people living around. We help each other. So it's not really new. By 1967, Tanganyika had merged with the island of Zanzibar to become Tanzania. Nereri had been advocating his brand of African socialism for more than four years. 
but he had not imposed it on the country. He now decided to write it into law. Nereri laid out his roadmap to socialism in a speech that became known as the Arusha Declaration. This was a declaration, as, as it said, not just for Tanzania, but for all of Africa. And indeed, other Africans did look upon it that way because it was the most complete, most ambitious attempt to create a kind of communist manifesto for Africa. Nereri nationalized the banks and major industries, promising to give workers control of the means of production. And foreign investments would be turned away in the name of self-reliance. According to Nereri, socialism would now pave the way to true independence. The declaration, when it came out, uh, spelled out so many things, a certain kind of utopia. There was this feeling that um, uh, alongside economic development, you created a new human being. It was a whole new idea that talked about um, caring for the next uh, fellow. It was an exciting um, uh, period. Nereri encouraged Tanzanians to reorganize their communities into collectives he called Ujamaa villages. These new villages would build socialism, and they would also provide access to schools, hospitals, and water. Across the harbor from the capital city of Dar es Salaam, Gesalole became an Ujamaa village in 1971. <laughs> After Mwalimu Nyerere encouraged us to form Ujamaa villages, we were the first to respond and make our village an Ujamaa village. After we began leading the Ujamaa way of life, we were able to get facilities for keeping poultry, fishing. See that boat over there? We didn't have it before. We got it with our own initiative, and we made progress. Nereri's vision of African socialism won the admiration of many in the West. As the Cold War intensified, many saw it as the best alternative to Soviet-style communism in the Third World. Support, both moral and financial, poured in. Uh, World Bank presidents would fly out, heads of donor agencies uh, would fly out, uh, students would come to spend a half a year or a year at the University of of Dar es Salaam. The University of Dar es Salaam was a great place in the mid-1960s and early 70s. This was seen as a serious, well-reasoned um, uh, attempt at socialism, and the feeling was, uh, let's support this experiment. 